Um, thank you, Nick. This is where I come in. So my name is uh, Ben Heimel. Um, I've kind of written a bit over the years about, about kind of mass observation, mainly from a kind of historical perspective, but I've also used the material from, from later decades. Um, I, do, I mean, there was so much in both your kind of introductions that I wanted to kind of kind of pick up on. Um, and I kept thinking of all these, you know, wonderful phrases that the mass observation, you know, the people who 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 set the thing up in the first place used to talk about home intelligence, all these kind of phrases that kind of don't really kind of fit together um, uh, how you would how you would imagine them. But I just wanted to go back to this, this, um, this, the first May the twelfth, and just think about, um, you know, here was a group of people, and they were claiming that um, we don't uh, we don't know about a population's everyday life. We don't know about the kind of ordinary days that people have in their kind of ordinary lives, and then they go and decide. That the the day to do a collective diary is on the coronation of the new king. You know, after one of the biggest uh, political um, kind of shenanigans with the kind of you know the, the previous king running off with an American divorcee. You're kind of thinking, wow, uh, you're, you're kind of this the whole project seems to be going in in into. Two different directions and of course that really connects with with your project nick which is um hardly kind of everyday life in in it in its kind of uh a normal kind of ordinary state now uh mass observation when they the, before they hit that um may the 12th date they're doing also they're interested in all sorts of really weird things they're really interested in the burning down of Crystal Palace and, and, and treating that as a kind of, you know, this is their surrealism, I think. The, 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 these, these things are kind of almost kind of social signs of things happening, so things happening across, across, across Europe. And of course, this was also a kind of political project. So, so thinking about Europe, about on the, on the brink of, 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 of kind of Nazism was, was also kind of part of part of that project, part of the reason for thinking how important it was to think about kind of ordinary people's voices. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about how you, how you thought about that as you were kind of working on the book, how you brought that sense of the ordinary and the extraordinary together. Yeah, it's a very good question, Ben. Um, and you pick up one of the th things, the things that fascinates me about the, the original mass observation as well. I'd, I'm not sure that many of us would still be working on mass observation, thinking especially about the original mass observation, if it wasn't for the fact that it was an organisation characterised by so many contradictions, paradoxes, conflicts, and so on, which is every time you think you're understood it and you've got it pinned down um you you find out something new or you read something different which makes it seem strange again um so yeah that's one of the reasons i think why i keep coming back um so the original mass, mass observation was was trying to do lots of different things wasn't it one of the projects was to try and um <sighs> try and make available the ordinary so that it could be critiqued. But um, there was also that much more immediate instrumental sense of we want, to, we want to intervene in public debates and we want to bring knowledge to um, into the public sphere that will compete with what politicians are saying or with what um, the newspapers are saying about some of these big events that are happening right at the moment. So um, they wanted to be able to say something about Coronation Day and 
that they wanted to enter an argument almost with that they imagined that newspaper editors were going to paint Coronation Day in a particular way. And they thought it would be nice to be able to have some evidence to show that the newspapers weren't doing a very good job of speaking for the, the people. So there's a lot going on that. If I just jump forward to thinking about this idea of the ordinary and the extraordinary um, and the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we could talk more about this, but one of the reasons why we get 5,000 diaries on May the 12th is because on 2020 is because May the 12th, 2020 is an extraordinary May the 12th compared to previous May the 12th. Um, people in their di diaries, nevertheless, um, do write about ordinary life. We get plenty of material about getting up, having a shower, making breakfast, what I had for for lunch um, and, and so on and so on. Um, but one of the things that is really fascinating is the interaction between the ordinary and the extraordinary in some of the diary extracts. So as you were speaking, I, I flicked in the book to just one very brief diary extract. So this is a woman in her 60s, um, uh, she, she's retired and she writes, um, a book arrives in the post we treat it with caution. Should we put it aside for three days until any virus on the packaging is dead? And the, the third sentence there is necessary for contact so that we understand the, the first two sentences, but it's the first two sentences that I just find really, really striking. A book arrives in the post, we treat it with caution. These, these are like the, own, the opening lines from some futuristic novel or something. Um, for, for me, a book arriving in the post is just the most ordinary thing in the world as an academic who orders lo lots of books. Um, the idea that we should treat a book with caution, um, I mean, I quite like that idea. I, I, I love the idea that books should be treated with caution because they might be dangerous and explosive and so on. But, um, but yeah, that that contrast between the, the very ordinary, I get a delivery, and then the, the very extraordinary, the delivery is dangerous. The delivery is how, how death might come into the house is uh, one of the things that, that makes the diaries really nice to read, I think. Yeah, and, and um, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, this is kind of true of um, kind of mass observation in general, I think, is, is that that sense that there is no, there is no ordinary, and there is no extraordinary. There, there, there's always the ordinary and the extraordinary, and there's always the extraordinary as soon as you start kind of poking about in in, in the ordinary. Which is, I think, also that sense of um, there are, you know, there is no uh, mass population. There's only people, and and the and the and the and the kinds of things that we use to try and divvy up this population, class or gender or, or things, are, are just simply those kind of categories that, that, that do, because you're a social scientist or you're interested in gender or you're interested in class, you know, they, they, they fall apart in the absolute um, eccentricity of every single person. An eccentric isn't, so some unusual person walking down the street with a kind of spinning bow tie, uh, they, you know, that that's the lesson you learn, isn't it? That, that actually, we're, you know, this is the, the category where we're, we're all in. But there was also that sense, and, and I was kind of thinking, as I quite often do, that the, there's, this, there's this phrase that um, George Orwell uses, when he's talking about um, the Second World War, and he's 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 writing these letters from London um, for the uh, a, a, an American uh, newspaper. I can't remember if it's a Tribune or Paris. I can't remember what what the what the newspaper is. And he's and and they're kind of asking, well, you know, what's it like in London at the moment? What's kind of everyday life like with kind of bombs dropping on people? And he kind of talks about, well, you know. The, the um, Londoners um, 
you, you know, they're kind of resilient, but they're also passive. Uh, you know, they should, this is, this is a moment where people should be demanding change, kind of transformation. This is a, a moment kind of the potential of the socialism. Um, and then he goes on, but, but they just uh, keep on keeping on. And it's that sense of keep on keeping on, which is, you know, which is the 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 sense that everyday life always carries on, whether you're in a prison cell or whether you're in a, a hospital ward, whether you're a, a, a midwife or a, a driver or all the all these things. Where you know the most extraordinary and awful. Uh, periods of history can will maintain you know everyday life maintains it might be transformed hugely but it but, but it kind of kind, kind of changes um and I was kind of very interested in that kind of resilience that notion of resilience which is very much in you, you know as a kind of deep theme through your book I guess um alongside you know resilience is Today is a kind of value that, that the people talk about. We need to get our children resilient. So it's very much kind of used for thinking about schooling and things. Um, but, but there's also this kind of sense of, there's kind of quite a kind of pessimism as well, I think, in terms of resilience and just kind of keeping on, keeping on. I just wondered how you, you know, optimism and pessimism are quite often things that, that we kind of look at in terms of something like the, Kind of mass observation here. I mean, how we, how are you, how are you feeling the kind of temperature of uh, pessimism and or, or optimism throughout the throughout the book? Yeah, um, that's my my briefer answer is that both seem to exist in in great amount. So that, that there's a an entry in in the book on grief and people um and, and that gathers together a set of extracts where people are, are writing about having lost loved ones or um fear, fearing losing loved ones and i mean some of those extracts are you know are de deadly serious and quite um harrowing in some respects to read and i'd there was there was a point um, during my work on the book where I I left my piles of papers and work and so on on the desk and I'd gone off to have some lunch or something, and my wife came down um, stairs and and asked me what I was doing and why I was putting myself through this and why I was reading these things again and again given that that some of it was really quite dark. Um, but there's also an entry in the book on hope. And um, often the structure of the diaries would be kind of begin with how difficult this is and the awful news that we've had as a family and so on, and then pivot to, well, okay, so how are we going to get through this and what might their, their future bring and, and so on. So th there's a structure to people writing about um, about these things sometimes, I think. Um, the other thing that comes through, I hope, in the book, because it certainly came through in, in the diaries that I was reading, is the role of humour in all of this. There, there's, um, I mean, some of the diaries are unintentionally very funny, I think, but some of the diaries are intentionally um, funny and people also write about using humor as one of the means of getting through um the the pandemic there's i'm not going to be able to find the the extract for this one and actually that there's a few i'm not sure if there's anything that captures it quite nicely and succinctly but one of the things that became apparent to me was that humor and especially the circulation of jokes and funny memes and so on via social media was one of the ways that people that people cared for one another during the pandemic it was an excuse to, to share a meme with a family member or a funny joke online with a family family member 
was a way of checking up on them, checking they were okay, getting a response so that you, you knew that they were still kind of alive and engaged and able to respond and so on. And to do that whilst allowing them dignity, a cert certain amount of respect and so on, because you weren't saying, you're vulnerable, I'm worried about you, are you okay? You were saying, here's a funny thing I thought you might laugh at because it, it amused me. But really often what people seem to be doing, and you get this kind of thick description in the diaries, like they're, you know, the, like what I was taught about at anthropology, you don't only, only get the act of sharing the joke, but also you, by the time you've read enough of these diaries, you feel like you understand the, the deeper meaning behind the sharing of the joke, which isn't just, I wanted to make someone laugh, but I wanted to, to check in in a lighthearted way to make sure they were okay without upsetting them or scaring them. Mm. Yeah, there's that um, Winnie, Winnie the Pooh thing, isn't there? I just wanted, to, I can't remember what the phrase is, but it's just, you know, it, in, in kind of academic talk, it's about kind of, kind of phatic communication. But Winnie the Pooh also talks about it. So it's not that academic. It's just, a, you know, making contact with people just to be sure of someone, just to be, you know, kind. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's humour all the way through it. I, I mean, I just picked up uh, any old page uh, a moment ago and um, there was just a, this list of, it, it was in the section on gratitude. And uh, so I was saying, these are things I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for. And you know, just house, boyfriend, family, all these things. And then the final one is my noise cancellation headphones. So you kind of, <laughs> you've named all these things that you're really grateful for. And then it's a, but you kind of, I really need these to get rid of all these things as well. You know, it's actually kind of, Kind of, kind of, kind of block them out, and I think that that kind of living these kind of contradictory emotions and things is 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 very, very kind of interesting. Um, I mean, I think the book you you talk about um, uh, kind of surrealism and and thinking about um, the form that something like this happens. And it did, it did remind me that of course you know this is a day in the life of a population isn't it so it's like a single day and of course um modernism you know the great kind of kind of modernist works were often obsessed with this idea of the single day um virginia wolf's um mrs dalloway is a certain single day most famously james joyce ulysses is is set on this kind of single day um, and and I think there's there's something kind of fascinating about this, uh, and 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 kind of impossible as well, you know, because well, because that idea of kind of like a day diary is like right, okay, the, as uh, Kirsty was saying, that kind of you know slicing through um, a, a culture, a society, and right at this minute, what was everyone kind of doing? What was everyone kind of feeling and thinking? And then, of course, as you as you sort of start looking at the material, it's very rarely just about what's happening at that point. It always spills out as you, as you're kind of writing in the book about, you know, what do we hope for or what do we remember? You know, there's the the one of the things that you very you start off with. So, oh, what, what's today like? Well. It's exactly the same as the last sixty days, uh, and 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 that and one of the things that reminded me of wasn't so much um, these these books like Mrs. Dalloway and, and Ulysses and all those other kind of one day books, but but what Freud says about dreams. I'm not saying there's kind of kind of psychoanalysis thinking, but, but one of the things he talks about dreams is is that dreams. What what happens in dreams is we take the day's residues, and I've always loved that phrase, the day's residues. You know, the kind of the the flotsam and jetsam that we kind of leave behind, the things that that 
you know, you know when you're a, a kid and you're writing a diary, you, you know, you, ne you could never think of anything to put in the diary. Did my homework, ate tea, we had beans, you know. So, and, but all, all the things that, that are eventful aren't the day's residues. The day's residues are all this other stuff, this kind of, you know, the, the, the same old, same old, the uh, um, going to school, the daily commute, all, 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 all these things. But, but Freud says the dream is, is this kind of all these residues, but it's structured according to memory and desire. And I think that's a really kind of interesting thing that, that you know, that, that our dream world is this kind of very ordinary stuff, often really, really banal. But it, but it's kind of um, uh, passed through these, these, these very human things of, of memory, but also of desire, anticipation, hope. Um, and I wondered how you were, how you were kind of thinking about those, those, those kind of structures of time, I suppose. Yeah, it's um. I mean, first of all, in the tradition of mass observation, we we get people writing about their dreams. So mass observation very explicitly in, in the early years, and I think more recently as well, has asked people to tell us about your dreams, which is, I think, always a, a lovely question. A relatively unprompted, people do write about their dreams. And a lot of what people wrote about their dreams, I, I ended up putting in the entry on anxiety because people's dreams did contain sort of the ordinary. They dreamt about some fairly mundane stuff, but people interpreted their dreams often as being anxiety dreams. So people would, would write about how they'd been having a, a lot of dreams about being in enclosed spaces, or they'd been having a lot of dreams about touching other people people wanting to hug them or shake their hand. Um, and so the, the, the dream proceeds as normal up until the point where someone arrives and tr offers their hand to be shaken. And that's when the, the person wakes up and, and remembers remembers the dream. Um, in, in terms of thinking about sort of surrealism and capturing the, the single day and so on, um, I I have lots of thoughts about this. It's it, it's something I I feel like I could pursue endlessly um, as a as a scholar because it it, it fascinates me. Um, I I use a, a quote in the book by Anne Enright who's writing about James Joyce, um, and she talks about how but an account of a particular day, and in this case Ulysses, um, ends up for her making the world bigger. And it's, it's a really interesting idea that a, an, a, an account of something so small, like a single day, um, could could make the world bigger. And I, I think the point being made is that if you put boundaries or constraints around what what you're studying or the, or the object of, um, of discussion, so a single day, or Georges Perec often used to um, focus just on a very small place, and then... Um, you have scope to to detail everything about that particular day or that particular place, and in doing so, um, we we get to see just how much happens in one day. And it's it's only a small leap from wow, that's how much happens in just one day to just how much happens in a lifetime. Um, and the, the other. Point I just, I'll just make quickly is you mentioned um, about the idea that on the one hand of a day is just a day and also what happens ordinarily on a day is perhaps the same as what happens on another day and so people kind of write about well today's just like all the other days I've had in lockdown but I, partly I think because Paul Auster's just died I've I found myself thinking about Paul Auster's film Smoke. I don't know if, if if people will be familiar with with this film on the on the call, but it in Smoke um, that that Paul Auster wrote the screenplay for Harvey Keitel runs a tobacco shop on the corner of a street in Brooklyn, and every morning he goes across the street, he sets up his camera, 
he um, focuses his camera on the front of his tobacco shop and at 8 a.m. every morning he takes a photo. And there's a there's a scene in the film where he's showing these photos in these photo albums to one of the other characters in the film. And the, this other character leaves through all the photos and gets to the end of the first album. And Harvey Keitel gets another album off the shelf and says, here's another one. And the other character says, it, but they're all the same. Why would I want... They're, they're all very nice, but they're all just photos of the front of your shop. And the Harvey Keitel character says... Well, they're all the same, but they're all different. The sun hits the earth at a different angle every morning. The camera captures a different person or bird or traffic incident in the foreground between the camera and the shop. Um, and the, he recommends that this person looking through the photo album slows down and, and, and notices more. Um, I guess focusing on one day, whether it's um, the 12th of May in the Mass Observation Day Diaries or whether it's in, in modernist literature, um, gives us that excuse to slow down and to notice more. Mm. I do, I'm very familiar with that film uh, for probably just the same reasons that, that, that you are. Um, yeah, that kind of extraordinary, and, and the character finds I can't remember what the ex-wife or some some kind of lost mm. person in the in in the photographs. But also reminded me very much of another series called Shooting the Past, where they use this huge great photo album of just very kind of ordinary uh, uh, photographs and kind of track people uh, and these kind of extraordinary stories of the the thirties and the forties. Yeah, that that kind of kind of slowing down and 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 seeing um, something in the in the repetitions and and, and things, which which again I also think is very, you know, it, it does make you think about how you use something like the Mass Observation Archive and and that kind of, you know, we live uh, in a world just on the edge of revolution constantly normally revolution for the for the worse uh, uh, and and i suppose what you know one of the revolutions we're on at, at the moment is ai and, and kind of big data and it must be very well, on the one hand i guess kind of big data people must look at observation and, and think that's not big data <laughs> you haven't even begun to give me kind of big data but yet there is a quantity to it there is a kind of there's, there's a the mass in the mass observation, um, and yet it often is that kind of you know working through these things, kind of seeing patterns, and it not being about the patterns at all. It not being about the you know how we can turn this into something that kind of policy people would would appreciate or statistical people would appreciate. It's often the the, the kind of um, you, you, you know the the moments where kind of lightning strikes, where something kind of kind of a, absolutely kind of comes out. Um, so there's always that kind of weird thing, isn't it? That it is about the mass, but it's not about the mass. It's about these very very specific things, and it's it really is about kind of engagement of, of, about what what talks to you. And I can imagine kind of reading this book and. You know, certain things just absolutely, you know, popping out like kind of crazy, and other things just kind of drift drifting by. And I, I, and I imagine that would kind of change over over time. And I was interested in, you know, that that idea of of this just being one version, and a, a, you know, how we might think about remixing it and. I mean, you've 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 taken kind of ten ten percent of the archive and, and done your thing with it. You might want to do other because you know this material. You might want to do other things with it. I was thinking about how well it might sound as a as a as a sound installation or radio play with just voices coming in and out and and a kind of you know really giving a collage kind of flavor of the day. Um, you know, there's some really great. Um, examples of kind of kind of kind of experimental radio things from 
and uh, people like Glenn Gould, the pianist, who went into kind of experimental radio and made these kind of really lovely, almost kind of musical kind of sound collages of, 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 of the day. Um, so, I'm, so I'm offering you a new job, Nick. <laughs> Maybe think about this as a kind of sound installation, or, or just to ask you about what what your other, you know, how you might take it further, or think about kind of remixes or different versions of it. I really like the idea, Ben. I hope Kirsty and Susanna are taking notes because, uh, that, I mean, it, whether it was me that did it or whether this is something that mass the mass observation archive and the archivist can do with, with with the archive, and I I think. I think it would be great and there's endless possibilities as well. There's so much material there. And as you say, the challenge is to work out what to do with it. And the temptation is to, we have the techniques now to be able to, to crunch large qualitative data sets through software and produce findings. And the, people keep asking me what my findings are from this research. Um, and I am interested in that as well. So I've uh, I've currently um, teamed up with a um, someone in the digital humanities here at Southampton, and and hopefully we will uh, use some techniques from digital humanities to to just see what can be done with what what's an enormous um, body of material in the COVID nineteen collections at, at Mass Observation. But that's not really my preference. My um, as I hope comes through in the book. Uh, I'm much more interested in, I guess, the approaches of the surrealists and people like Walter Benjamin and the idea that ideally I want to be able to, to tell a big story, but without reducing all of the parts to just their role within the whole. So um, Walter Benjamin talked about being a, a collector and collecting unique things and um i think that the, the diaries that mass observation writers write are are unique things and the stories that they tell are, are unique things and that it feel to so to me techniques like montage and so on are, are are the ones that work really well as opposed to techniques perhaps from the digital humanities that that end up finding finding patterns across the material and silencing the the individual voice in, in the process of, of doing so. Um, I would love it if someone uh, someone did something for for radio or, or an audio piece of work out, out, out of this material. I think that's a great idea. Mm. Well, I mean, it could be you. It could be you. someone on the call. Mm -hmm. um, talking about someone on the call, uh, let's open this up to uh, other people to see if there are kind of uh, other people want to ask Nick questions or, or just want to talk about some of the themes that we've been discussing. Or ask Kirsty and Suzanne questions about uh, the, the 12th May diary project as well. I mean, maybe that would be a, like a really nice um, project to think about how, you know, because it's always, and I think kind of mass observation had this problem with, you know, they imagined that they were going to write all these books based on all the, the stuff that they've uh, they've been given. They never really did. Oh, here we go. With the 5,000 responses in 2020, do you think, You'll have to put. Oh, I can't see. Really see that. Um, to put a gap on the submissions at some point. Is it still growing? Yeah, <laughs> it is, but not exponentially. That was an exceptional year. So, on an average twelfth of May year, we may get a few hundred. I think we peaked at a thousand before the twenty twenty, um, and that was because we were doing quite a lot of engagement work with schools at that time, which we still are. But um, I think. Um, the nature of 12th of May means that even if we only get a, a few hundred in, say this year or say last year, I think mm. we got about a few hundred mm. in last year, it's still such rich material that you can do so much with it. So although, 
and we're also getting material in digitally as well as in hard copy so mm. it's it's growing in sort of different ways um so I think it's more a question of how do we wrestle with the many many opportunities to engage with the material and reuse the material mm. and teach and learn and 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 and, and, and kind of optimize uh the opportunity for people to 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 kind of relate to the material um that's i think our ongoing challenge in terms mm. of our capacity rather than the collecting of it yeah and really just to add um i mean you touched on it earlier but the the creative create uh, creative submissions uh are received with lots of our regular directives lots of our regular uh questionnaires that go out to our national panel um have creative submissions but this um yeah it's interesting 50 years too it's uh this generates much more you know because it's a less of an ask it's one day um and we don't put anything on deadlines or literacy and it really speaks to us working with lots of grassroots organizations so people use it as, as, within education sessions or around literacy but it's a really an opportunity for us to open up the opportunities for wider audience to participate and have their voice within within the archive, within the collection. Um, so, yeah, we're still keen to do it, but there's so much more we want to do in using the material that has already come in. And I, I was um, thinking after a brief conversation with Ben yesterday about why we got 5,000 responses in, in 2020. And I, and I was trying to think about what, what the diarists said of, about why they'd written in. And I mean, you two might, might have your own thoughts and hopefully you'll, you'll be able to tell them to, to us in a moment. Um, but I noted down some of the reasons that, that diarists are given, for perhaps diarists who hadn't previously written for mass observation for, for submitting a diary in, in May 2020 and so there was they had more time on their hands especially if they were furloughed or they were um retired and having to stay at home um because of the lockdown um diaries coming from school kids were often organized by schools and presumably Suzanne had a a bit of a role in that as well but um schools were desperate for things to do to allow homeschooling to take place, to structure homeschooling. So this was a good opportunity for schools. Um, a lot of people during the pandemic were having to stay at home because that's what they were told to do, but feeling like that wasn't enough, feeling that they wanted to contribute in some way. If they weren't a key worker, they felt like the country was going through a crisis and they weren't able to contribute perhaps as they would like to do to the collective effort to deal with the crisis. Um, some of them recognised that staying at home was a contribution, but for some of them writing the diary was something you could do to sort of make a social contribution at a time of crisis. There were then a few people who wrote about how the pandemic had made them feel mortal that they feared death now much more than before. They felt that it might be around the corner compared to it not having been previously, and that it was time to put their affairs in order. And one of the ways of putting their affairs in order was to um, sort out their bank statements and make their finances legible for their children. But one of the ways of putting their affairs in order was to, to set down their stories. And so people would write down family stories for their daughters that their daughters would be able to pass on to their grandchildren, for example. And I wonder if writing for mass observation was was one way of setting down your stories. Um, that, that Some people genuinely feared that they wouldn't still be here on 12th of May 2021 when they were writing their diaries on 12th of May 2020. So this was an opportunity to put affairs in order. And then the final thing, which... Um, I think probably connects 12th May 2020 to some of the writing for mass observation in the earlier period around the Second World War was this sense of living through history. Mm -hmm. um, people yeah. are, are very aware that this is a moment of history and, and that potentially future historians might be interested in their everyday lives because they're living through a moment of history. It just in the same way that a lot of mass observers who right now are interested in the everyday lives of people during the Second World War. 
and that's one of the ways people often come to to know about mass observation and to take an interest initially. I've, Kirsty, Suzanne, do you think I'm... I'm, I'm yes, I would, no, I think that absolutely nails it. I think from the responses I read and from speaking to people who wanted to engage, um, I think that sense that that life is no longer ordinary. I mean, we, we the challenge we face every year with 12th of May is convincing people that it's the ordinary yeah. we're interested in. And in fact, the more humdrum, the better, because people don't necessarily place a value on their everyday lived experience. And so when I work with community groups, when I'm in prison teaching or I'm working with school groups, I'm always emphasizing that it is the ordinary and the everyday that mass observation really, really celebrates and really, really values as should mm. they. But it wasn't until that extraordinary period of, of people's lives that people then sort of put pen to paper or collages or whatever mm -hmm. and thought, actually, this is something worth documenting, and worth recording. Um, and I think that what that's what tipped the balance. I think that's what piqued people's um, sort of enthusiasm and their interest, because suddenly they could see a value in their own lived experience, which to my mind is quite sad, because what I'm trying to do all the time is to point out that there is the extraordinary in the ordinary mm -hmm. every day. And that's something that we want to be mindful of and want to kind of capture in all the work that we do so that's an ongoing uh an ongoing challenge that we face um but it is about convincing people i know years ago i worked with a community group of older people from sort of a local area to here and they'd come for a visit at the keep and i chatted to them about recording their day diaries and some of them were interested some less so but i was chatting to one older lady and she said oh you don't want to hear about my day nothing ever happens to me i just live in my flat i don't do anything i don't and she was very very down on her sort of day-to-day -day lived experience and i sort of said no i i really do that's really really what that's the bread and butter of mass observation that's what we really want to know about and then she thought for a while and then she got a little twinkle in her eye and she said, oh, I know, I'll get myself a fancy man for the month of May and then I'll have something to write about. And I thought, you still don't get the point. The point is the ordinary the every day, yeah. not your kind of uh, your fling. Um, but it is. And similarly with yeah. the with the prisoners we work with um, and we work across the, the sort of prisoner state nationally, but specifically with uh, prisoners at HMP Lewis, which is our local prison to here. Um, it's about them having the opportunity to share their voice, share their lived experience, be that, you know, their 23 hours a day in their cell or what's in their imagination or their thoughts and feelings or reflections about their lives more generally. And that is what we're really interested in. So um, hopefully we can continue to beat that drum and convince more mm -hmm. people each year. Um, but I think, yeah, I think all of the the, the, the points that you made about 2020 made it oh, very, definitely. very definitely extraordinary time for everyone and I think it had a knock-on effect there was a lovely one I received from a woman who said I've just been given this 11 o'clock at night um I'm staying with my sister and the children I've just been told to do this and then she seemed really frustrated and she kind of got into it and and so we had this whole submission from her and her sister and her two kids and everyone was kind of like buying into yes this is really important we're doing this kind of time capsule and documenting it um so yeah, it, yeah, it just it just uh, struck a chord. But for us, we were yeah, obviously absolutely overwhelmed. Didn't anticipate that it would it would generate that much. Um, I remember doing some footage. I'm reminded that our village school writing about our village for the BBC DM set, which must have been around 1986. Yeah, yeah, we do. It's quite nice actually. We get uh, we often get some. Um, we've had a few volunteers back here at the keep who then rifled through the 12th of May diaries from the last 10 years and found the one that they've submitted from their recent school. They were like, I remember doing this and looking back. So yeah, it does spark a lot of memories. On the question of whether people think their days are interesting enough or they're, they're ordinary, um, perhaps as in on a particular day are, are interesting enough. Something that struck me over the last couple of days in just um, talking about the book with people and and a few people have been reading our tax tracks and so on, is some um, different diary extracts grab different people and in different ways. So things that I might have underlined as being the things that I want to read out on these occasions haven't been the same as necessarily other people. And it's really interesting for me to see which, um, which extracts people are picking up on and noticing um it almost also makes me wonder well how much did i leave in the archive that i thought oh that's not very notable that's not worth putting in the book that actually someone else would think oh that's an absolute gem that's a uh, gold dust so yeah i just wonder if we're not very good 
we're not very good judges ourselves about what other people might find interesting about our lives. Um, and I, just as you were talking, I turned to the second to last extract in the book is from a woman in her 40s from Southeast England. She's a heritage collections manager. And she says, it's 9 p.m. now. I feel like I haven't, con oh no, that's not the right one. Excuse me. Um, different one, the one above it. Um, so third extract from the end. A woman in her 40s from Northwest England, she's a clinician. And she says, I tell a friend about this diary and suddenly get paranoid when she says her day isn't interesting enough. Is mine, question mark. And I mean, <laughs> my answer was yes, yes. Interesting enough to put in the book, actually. <laughs> um, but there's also that sense of, because, um, you know, when you're a kind of school kid and you're doing this or, or some of the ways that you're kind of addressed as as as, as thinking about posterity um, makes it all seem like a very kind of worthy uh, kind of project. But actually, one of the very first things I remember reading about this was a woman saying, oh, um, you know, no one's interested in me, um, but uh, I'm just a working class housewife. But on uh, on the Sunday of this month, uh, yes. suddenly my my stuff's important, and yeah. and I'm and I've become you know transformed, and 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 I was thinking that so many people must have started diaries during lockdown. I mean, I know I did, and I didn't carry it on, but I certainly carried it on for, for, for several months. I know some people have carried it on for you know a few years, writing every day, writing really quite a lot. And just thinking about how different um, that moment of uh, uh, May the 12th, 2020 was from other you know, periods like the Second World War, because we were kind of thrown into re reflexivity, reflection. Yeah. You know, we, we started, yeah hearing the birds we started looking at the leaves and all these kind of you know we would we would suddenly turn into our own blooming micro anthropologists looking at <laughs> the wood louse in the kitchen and uh, <laughs> it was kind of something really lovely I think just about I mean I know it wasn't a, a nice experience it wasn't a good experience but there were lovely things within it uh, that, that happened and again, it's, it's that, um, thinking about this as a, a researcher, it's, it's the putting of constraints around a, a study or a life um, is one of the things that then encourages that re reflection. So that people's lives were constrained. It was stay in this one place, don't go out. Um, mm -hmm. And at that point, people start to notice the flowers in their garden they've never noticed before or, or whatever it, it might be. And I, I think that there's an analogy there between what people are experiencing during the pandemic by being confined at home and the way in which the 12th of May day diary works, which is you put a con constraints around the day um, and it encourages people to notice. And also it encourages researchers reading those diaries, um, looking across so many different accounts of just one day and um, to notice the details we might not always might not always notice, but it does take some some time and some patience and some immersion on the part of the people writing the diaries and on the part of the people reading them. And um, it probably takes a particular kind of psychology. I I would have thought, um, you know, the the same people who who read these diaries might also be long distance runners and. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the sort of person who's able to just sort of pound mm. um, along a until they, they talk about long, long distance runners eventually getting sort of a different view of the road. It's only after a period of time when you're exhausted that you begin to notice the tarmac in a different way and so on. And I think one of the things I was trying to do in reading the diaries was sort of exhaust myself to the point where I was almost in a dream world immersed in these diaries and... Um, and at that point, the, the idea was I might notice things in them that previously I'd been overlooking for being not noteworthy. Mm. 
that's what I was going to ask you, Nick, like how with uh, the contents page, like, you know, that you, you showed everyone at the start and the themes that came out, how, what was the process like with that? I imagine that there were some themes that were just there from the beginning, but, you know, it's quite an interesting mix and you could see how some of those could go really nicely together but you'd I think that there was like a, a whatsapp and a zoom you know that could easily have been like technology or social media and stuff but obviously with the extent of it and the, like how could you just say a little bit about how that came about this kind of themes and yeah yeah I mean a, a pretty messy process to be honest um no um no robust defendable method or or technique really um some some of the the entries are but forms of words that people used a lot in their diary so kind of like covid keywords so um things like um the new normal for example um so they i think those those or or categories that were cl clearly obviously crucial during the pandemic like furlough or uh, and so on so some of those came quite easily and i felt like they they almost came without too much involvement from me actually but some of the others not so much and i wanted to decenter myself a lot from the book and provide as little interpretation as possible and let the diaries speak as much as possible but where I couldn't decenter myself was really in the selection of the, the, the entries so much and um my guess is if another scholar looked at the same material as me they might have come up with some very different um entries and there was an, an article in um in cultural studies that was about the pandemic and um had a list of keywords that um that they thought was sort of the covid keywords and they were writing out of the north american context um and there isn't a huge amount of overlap between what they came up with and my contents page which suggests to me actually that it is a little bit of a mirror of my own experience of the pandemic certainly my situation in the uk during the pandemic um and perhaps a bit of a reflection as well of the the kinds of people writing for mass observation and the kinds of things that they were writing about as well, which might not be quite the same as what people might have noticed in the US, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It does make me think that, you know, there are there are a few books like this. You, you mentioned that uh, Russian writer whose name I can't remember. Alexeyevich, um, Svetlana Alexeyevich. Yeah. And I mean, I think within journalism, you sometimes get people who've kind of interviewed lots of people. And, and so you get this idea of a kind of choral work or a kind of orchestrated kind of polyvocal work. Um, but but it's surprising, isn't it? Because we, you know, here we are uh, supposedly really kind of valuing democracy. And yet there's very few instances of culture where you could say, well, that's that's the kind of like a new form that seems kind of really kind of democratic uh, uh, in, in terms of the voices. And I think, in, you know, filmmakers, there's been a couple of films, haven't there, where I think Ridley Scott did one where, where, where you know, people were invited to, to make little films on the same day on their phones from, from all over the world and, and kind of they put it together. But, but there's something about that that, you know, it starts in the beginning and, ends at the you know sun going down but i think a book you can pick it you can you can read it all the way through but actually that you you can keep dipping into it and can changing your position and and hearing those, those 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 different voices so in some ways a book seems like a much better bet in terms of doing that kind of polyvocal polyvocal yeah. work i like the idea that if it... People have asked me, so what's what's the main argument, or what? So what's your critique? And I like the idea that it's hopefully going to be the reader who 
producers their the argument or, or the critique and everyone's going to read it slightly differently and um and take something from it but it potentially it's asking a lot of readers um but there is that that option to dip in and out as well as you say with the book compared to say to say a film or something um I'd, it, in this, um, while we're talking about this, we should probably mention the work of Annabella Pollen as well on um, a, the, a Day in the Life and other films like that that do, do um, or other um, projects like that that take lots and lots of photos or or lots of snippets of film, put them together. Um, she, uh, on the one hand writes quite beautifully and evocatively about those projects, but on the other hand, has been quite critical of them as well for the kind of overall message that they tend to end up communicating because as I think she's shown in her work how often if you ask people, for example, to try and capture um, their day in a photo and submit it and then you put all of those photos together, um, you tend to get certain themes emerging, kind of the the global community or international family sort of theme, or the local particular folkloric kind of theme. And and actually, she she ended up finding some of these projects to be quite predictable in terms of what they produced. So I I was thinking about that a little bit as I was putting together the book and wondering if if that's what the mass observation. 12th May project was going to produce and if my book was also going to produce something like like that I mean my my sense is that it doesn't and I think it might have something to do with the diary format that in, instead of asking people to select an image say mm. um, you're asking people to to write perhaps in some detail a, about their day um and and then there's the possibility as well for the researcher or the archivist to to select from that um that writing as well um but the I guess it allows the contradiction doesn't it in the in the way that photograph doesn't i mean i think if if, if those um you know day in the life photo projects had said send in a collage you know they'd have been completely different wouldn't they mm. Um, there's a couple of things in the chat that we should mention. One is, um, this is uh, Liz Craig. I keep a one line a day diary. My life is ordinary, but I would love it if I have one line a day from my ancestors from 100 or 200 years ago. That would be mm -hmm. amazing. I always love those things in at the um, on the radio in the morning where they say, on this day, <laughs> 250 <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always something kind of really obscure, and uh, and here we have something from uh, Kirsty uh, Thompson. I guess the Be Real app is mm -hmm. a new app for me. Mm -hmm. It's trying to do this, forcing you to take the photo at prescribed random time so that you can't pick a special moment and pretend it's your entry. That's great, isn't it? That sounds like a kind of uh, uh, an anti um, uh, Instagram app I'm, I'm sure it is it does make you think about the in, internet doesn't it about the social media which was really designed to be really democratic and and how 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 little kind of democracy there is and how how it seems to be about kind of the loudest voices or the most angry or the most, most passionate ones hmm. that that message about the with the one line a day um has, has just made me think of something um, which is uh, one of the, the most recent books I read was, I don't know if anyone else has read this on the call, it's called Alphabetical Diaries. It's by a woman called Sheila Hattie. Um, she kept a, I think she's quite a well-known novelist, I think, um, but it's the first book of hers I've read. And she kept a diary for about 10 or 15 years, millions of words, and then put every sentence into a spreadsheet, one line, per line of the spreadsheet and then ordered them by alphabet. So each chapter is, there's a chapter which is A, which is all the sentences beginning with A. 
And so it completely scrambles the temporality of the diary. But it's wonderful. I, I was riveted. It was completely readable, um, incredibly sort of honest and raw in the way that she she writes her diary. But the the, the project and the ideas behind the project absolutely fascinated me. So uh, mm. yeah, people are doing some really interesting things out there, I think. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, that's, um, uh, I mean, Kirsty uh, uh, Thompson goes on uh, from the, the, the Be Real of that, um, that, that actually is, you know, forcing us not to kind of curate our output. And she also thinks that book sounds amazing, which I think <laughs> it sounds amazing too. But that does make me think that maybe, you, you know, maybe some of that, um, you, you know, we use computers and things like that to kind of, in the, in the things like digital humanities to kind of come up with patterns and, and findings, but maybe something of the kind of random generating thing with the kind of archive like this would be really interesting to, you know, just like having a kind of website that just kind of popped up uh, endless um, bits of kind of COVID-19 diaries from 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 these 5,000, yeah, I, don't, I, I mean, I, I know we're not meant to use Twitter or X anymore, but a, a Twitter or an Instagram account that just randomly publishes an extract from these diaries every day forever would be great, I think. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. that someone somewhere yeah. could write the code to, to make that happen. Now now it's all digit, digitised. Uh, Kirsty. Thompson has all, all also sent us no, to a, a link to the Encyclopedia of an Ordinary Life. Right, thank you. Thank you. Which I will certainly look at. We're, we're at end of time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ellie has <laughs> Yeah, I have. Um, I've lost the, the bit where. Oh, yeah. uh, um, so yeah. I can wrap up and say thank you to uh, Kirsty and Suzanne for organising this and for Ellie for doing her thing and for Nick for giving us a, a new piece of uh, the mass observation puzzle. Um, and, and it's, I hope it does come tremendously well. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all for joining. Thank you. See you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>